It was December 12th, 2016. I came across a story here recently that I thought was so perfect for our subject today. All across the social media and internet, uh, celebrities and influencers all posted the same image at the same time. It really stopped the internet in one instance. It was a strange image. It was the image of an orange tile. So when you're flipping through your feed on social media, everything looks pretty the same. It's people with selfies. It's pictures of their latte art. But when you come across something different, you stop. And when people saw this and these people that really influence millions of people, some people that posted this have nearly 100 million people that follow them. And when you would click on this orange tile, this video would pop up. And here was the image that would follow after this. It was inviting all these young celebrities and influencers to a festival they called the Fire Festival. It was this exotic, exclusive event, but at the same time was open to anyone, but there were limited spots. So this fire festival would take place in the Bahamas on an exclusive island owned by the former drug lord, Pablo Escobar, where you could go away for a weekend. The greatest bands in the world, the greatest food in the world would be there, and you would be able to elevate your status. Day passes cost nearly $1,500. Most packages cost about $12,000 to attend. Some packages on the higher end were nearly $400,000 if you had the artist suite or cabana. This uh, event was founded by two men, one man named Ja Rule and the other named Billy McFarlane. He was a tech mogul that started to raise funds and money. So as people Started to hear this promo, the event sold out in 48 hours, two days. Never happened in history. An event that big that would sell out that fast that never really happened before. So daily, people would get these updates where this time clock is ticking, and the next day, the next day, the event would take place in about five months from the announcement. So people hop on these planes, they hop on these jets, they arrive to the Bahamas, and they're greeted by a yellow school bus. And they think, this is not what I paid for, they literally think it's a joke. So there's all these videos of people filming this and expecting this amazing event they're about to go to. As they arrive to the event, these beautiful beaches they promised are not what they expected. Here's what they expected to see, and here's what they arrived to. They actually arrived to construction sites. These beautiful cabanas that they were promised, here's a picture of some of the cabanas they were promised, they were greeted by these things. Disaster relief tents. Lastly, the gourmet food that they were promised by the best celebrity chefs. Here's a picture of one of the promos. They were all given styrofoam containers that contained cheese sandwiches. So here you have thousands of people that have spent thousands of dollars showing up to this giant scam. And what they learned took place. You have all these people. They called it. It was great. It was the, the rich millennials of Instagram meets the Hunger Games and Lord of the Flies. All they literally had was cheese sandwiches and alcohol. That's all they had at this place. And, and literally people are sending out photos and videos. Well, the American government had to get involved because now there's a national crisis on hand. You have thousands of people with nowhere to stay in the midst of storm season at the Bahamas. So they had to send in planes to get people out. So they wondered, where did all of this money go? And what happened was this. You have these two entrepreneurs that get this idea, and they pitched everyone's greatest fantasy. And upon releasing this video, they had all these people buy these tickets, and their goal was to raise this money then to build the festival with only four months to do it. And they left in this epic failure, this epic disaster that took place, where literally people, thousands showed up to the most disappointing event people know. There's now been multiple documentaries released about this great tragedy that took place. They stole so much money from investors, they're now being sued for $100 million for this uh, event that they'd put on and all the money that they stole and did not return from investors. One of the men is now serving a six-year federal prison sentence from what took place there. 
However, there was an interesting line in one of the documentaries I, I watched by this guy, Billy McFarland, and it really shows the condition of our common culture. He said this, we're selling a pipe dream to your average American loser, your average guy in middle America. See, they understood that if they could pose this image of what everyone desires to be, they could get their money in the end. That if there's this image that they could create, that everything is desiring to have, everyone's desiring to have, they knew they could get the money on the other end. This is what French philosophers warned us of in the 18th century. They started to explore these concepts as the Enlightenment was taking place. And they said, in the trajectory that our cultures are going, there will eventually be this belief, this philosophy that people live by. It was called materialism. They warned of a day when people would literally orient their lives around material things or objects. Here's what they say. Philosophy, this is the philosophy, that nothing exists except matter itself. It's an opinion or tendency based upon purely material interests. It continued to evolve until about the 1930s. It was considered a very low view of life. That if you adopt this philosophy, it was a low view of life, but in the end, it was a way of life based entirely on consumer goods. See, when your value, when you believe you've evolved from animals, all your life is based off the material acquisitions, what meal you're going to eat next, what person you may align with, this now determines your value. That what you've acquired or what you've attained now determines your worth. And marketing agencies know exactly how to sell it. One agency wrote about Starbucks. They said, Starbucks gets it. In 2018, it's less about the drink itself. It's about who the drink makes you. When you carry something or wear something, this determines your status and your significance. This determines who you are. We've all been victim to it. We see someone pull up in a brand new car. What do we say? What does that person do? You pull up to someone's house. You say, wow, how did they get this? We now assume that those that have acquired material things that are of great value must be worth more than us. And it results, people are learning how to craft their image to appear greater than they actually are. There's a company that's now becoming quite successful in Russia where you can, for a day, rent your own private Gulfstream plane. With that comes a photographer and a videographer. Here's a picture of what it actually looks like. Here's the catch. For about 500 American dollars, you have your videographer and photographer, but the catch is the plane never leaves the runway. You have a photo shoot so you can display it on your social media account to portray a life that you want to live but don't actually live. There's a market for these things because there's not a message that's overtaking the lie of the culture. See, we know there's a meaningful truth that is found only in the gospel. But it's so muted because I'm going to challenge us. I think the gospel in the modern America has bought into the same materialism. See, we have to pull back the mask. As Paul called it, we have to remove the veil. And if you want to experience genuine transformation, we have to learn to get vulnerable with actually who we are and see the value that God has instilled in us through the cross. This is our journey. You know, as we look at the United States and the founding fathers, we were promised life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. But America's never been more unhappy. We're learning that with the acquiring of so many things, we're actually left dead inside. There's this index that says that since the 1950s, every area of progress in America has been on the increase except for happiness. Every marker of progress has increased except happiness, health, cost of living. All these things have gone to our favor except happiness. Our American dream is left 
wanting. One study said this. This obsession with material things makes people overspend, overeat, and overextend their budgets. This is a secular study. Their homes are full, but their souls are empty. This is what Mother Teresa warned us of. You in the West have millions of people who suffer such terrible loneliness and emptiness. They feel unloved and unwanted. These people are hungry in the physical, not in the physical sense, but are in another way. They know they need something more than money, yet they don't know what it is. This morning, we're going to look at a story that I want to challenge you. Looks familiar because maybe you've heard it and you've read it to your children or you've heard it in Sunday school yourself. But I really believe is a key to understanding what the gospel is intended to look like in our modern culture. And what really the gospel does in the midst of a culture that is saturated with so many material things. Do me a favor, turn your Bible to Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Luke 19, verse 1, it says this. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. He is not just anyone, it's Jesus. And as he has this amazing interaction in Luke 18 with the rich young ruler, he's now walking into Jericho. Now Jericho, when you've heard the story in the past in the book of Joshua, it's not the, it's the same physical spot as Jericho, but would look much different than it did in the days of Joshua. We all know the story where they marched around, you know, for the multiple days, consecutive days, multiple times, and the walls fell. However, this Jericho is now one of the richest cities in all of the Roman Empire. This is a man named Josephus, who's a first century historian, said that Jericho was the fattest land in all of Palestine. That was the word that they would describe. It was excessive. It had so much fat. It was so luxurious that this was the place that everyone wanted to go. So here's Jericho. As Jesus enters the city, verse 2, it says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. How many have heard of Zacchaeus before? So here we have Zacchaeus. Now his name means righteous one. But Zacchaeus is anything than your model for righteousness. See, Zacchaeus was a, a tax collector, and it was different in the context of now. It wasn't H&R Block or the local tax guy that you work with. You see, what the Roman Empire would do is they would find men willing to betray their family and country. They would find those that had this entrepreneurial grace on them, and then they would say, okay, we want you to now extort your family and friends for the taxes that they own Rome. It was a little different than the concept that we understand. Here's what one scholar says. Roman officials contracted with local entrepreneurs to collect the prescribed indirect taxes, tolls, and tariffs, and customs fees. These entrepreneurs, the chief tax collectors, were required to pay the con contract in advance. So Rome would assess what the city was worth. That entrepreneur would then put a payment down to the Roman Empire, and that amount was undisclosed. It was private. No one knew the contracted amount that tax collector had worked out with the different governing officials. In return, they would pay them in advance. They would then employ other, uh, others to collect the taxes with the hope that the amount collected would yield a profit. So what they would do is they would go to your local business and say, I come in the name of Rome. They would know them. They would hire Jews because they knew Jews had access to families because if you were a Gentile, you were unclean. They didn't want to associate with you. So they would hire these various Jews. They would come in and they would say, the requirement of the Roman tax is this. And they would say, that's not possible. You charge so-and-so this. And he'd say, it doesn't matter. That's what you owe to the Roman Empire. And with them would come Roman centurions. And they could extort these businesses. Now, we don't have many pictures of what Zacchaeus looked like. But one picture I think captures the best image of what he looked like is this one right here. See, the best way to understand how Zacchaeus was. And some of you here is like, is that really a picture? No, it's not a picture. It's from the Godfather, for goodness sake. So here's the key is he was an understanding of the modern mafia. That would be the best way to understand him. That he would have this family of rogues that he would employ and that he would make sure you'd bring back the accurate amount. See, Zacchaeus was a powerful individual, but he was hated by his countrymen. See, they called them the sinners. So when Jesus would hang out with tax collectors, they're literally the outcasts of society. 
because they would bankrupt families. So here's Zacchaeus who hears about Jesus, verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not see because he was small in stature. Here's this juxtaposition. You see, Zacchaeus has everything culture in our modern context would desire. He had power. He had possessions. But he knew there was something that was missing. And it says that he was searching for Jesus. We have a culture that is searching for Jesus. They're looking for that truth. They're trying to find what that actual meaning for life is. And it's our responsibility of the body of Christ to show what genuine Jesus looks like. They're looking for the Jesus in you. They're searching for the Jesus in you. But unfortunately, the Jesus we often display is not the Jesus we find in the Gospels. See, we have to reconcile what a gospel-filled life, a good news-based life actually looks like. This is why he challenged his disciples to carry their crosses. This is the identification of what a disciple is supposed to look like. One that lives a life of sacrifice. One that lives a life of service, of dying to self. I just gotta be honest with you. We have a lot of self in us. John said it beautifully. Less of me and more of him. I know my family can use a lot less of me and more of Jesus. Your family can use a lot less of you and more of Jesus. We have to embrace this journey and see Zacchaeus is looking, he's searching, he's small, he's got the early Napoleonic complex. This is Zacchaeus. He's the small man in the room that has something to prove and it's the same condition our culture is stuck in. They feel like there's something they have to prove when all they're looking for is the victory that was found at the cross. And as Zacchaeus is looking, it says that he climbs this sycamore tree, verse 4. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass by him. See, a man of his stature, number one, he risks his life by entering a crowd without his guards. If there was anyone you wanted to stab, it was Zacchaeus. If there's anyone that you were in a crowd and you took out a shank and stuck him in the side, everyone would look the other way. He was the one you wanted to die. And he says, my livelihood is not as important as meeting Jesus. There's a life I have to see that's more important than my livelihood. This is the desperation that Jesus is looking for. And he enters the crowd, he pushes past the crowd, but as much as he can jump up ahead of their heads and shoulders, he can't see Jesus. So he runs. This was not normal for a man of stature. You did not run in public. It was not San Francisco where businessmen run to meetings in between. This is inappropriate. He's running in a robe. He's running in his full garb. And as he does this, he sees this sycamore tree. Now, we've all heard the story. We've all sung songs when we were young. But there's something unique that that Luke is crafting in this story. You see, a sycamore tree was not just short in stature. It produced what they called an inferior fig. Here's a picture of a sycamore tree. And here's a picture of a sycamore fig. See, this was the food of peasants. The sycamore trees were the unpruned, unharvested trees because it was an inferior fig. And that's the fruit that the poor would eat. So here's what Luke, I believe, is crafting. We remember the story where Jesus curses the fig tree because there's no fruit found on it. We captured this. We now have this man that's disregarded by society. He's an inferior son of Abraham, and he climbs this tree of peasants. And what happens next? As Jesus is looking in the crowd, he looks up to this tree, and he calls, verse 5, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus finds the inferior fruit of Israel. He rejects the tree of Israel, the fig tree that they were, and looks to the tree of the outcast and says, there's the harvest that's ripe. What's the harvest that God has set up in your life that you've overlooked? 
What's that thing that you've determined is inferior that God says is significant? What's that thing you've been ignoring? And here's Zacchaeus. He's there, and here's the beautiful thing. Jesus calls him by name. Jesus hasn't met Zacchaeus at all for nothing. No one would want to meet Zacchaeus. Surrey knows. Zacchaeus was someone that you would never want to associate with. And now here's the main event out of all the people identifies the most unwanted. And what it shows as the Holy Spirit gives Jesus this word of knowledge that God knows Zacchaeus. He was one that was considered a false son of Abraham. Someone that God would disown. And now Jesus says, you're one that God wants. Significant moment. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. This is what God in flesh is doing. He says, hey, I know your name, and I'm going to redeem your name. You're mine significant moment. And what he does is he restores his cultural and communal dignity. He says, I'm going to actually show up to your home today. Now, if you had someone invite themselves over to your house, I don't know we would be as excited as Zacchaeus was. We instantly think, I got to get things ready and my, my house is dirty. See, Jesus isn't concerned with how nice your house looks. He's more than content with your mess. And Jesus invites himself over like that nosy neighbor that opens up your fridge. He says, I really don't care how your bathroom looks. I want to hang out with you. See, God is calling your name. I love Revelation chapter 3. Again, when you read those seven letters to the churches, they are brutal and incredibly convicting. But John writes that Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door of knock and knock looking for those I can sit with, that I can eat with. See, Jesus is knocking and calling your name. We just have to let him in. I remember several years ago, it was in 2014, I had a massive health collapse, and I had to take medical leave for the summer, and I was so tired and so sick. And I remember I was on a run, and I'm having this dialogue with the Lord of like, hey, ministry was a great season, I'm ready to work at McDonald's. Like, that was the perspective. And as I'm running, I'm thinking, that we, I did all these great things, and we've developed this team, and I could hand it off and kind of ride into the sunset. And I go to this field. As I'm on this field, I'm, I'm stretching out. And I'm having this honest conversation with the Lord, and I hear this audible voice say, Keep going, Brandon. And I look around, and I'm like, The Lord has spoken to me but it sounds like a middle-aged man. And I'm looking, and it comes again, keep going, Brandon. And I'm I'm like, "This this is surreal experience. In the distance, I see this elementary track team, and there is one kid way behind everyone else that's slightly overweight running. And the coach is yelling in the megaphone, keep going, Brandon. Keep going. God speaks in mysterious ways. <laughs> he knows exactly what you need to hear. I know in that moment, if he spoke audibly from heaven, I would have taken it as a holy invitation. But that was a humbling one. Because I was Brandon, struggling on that old track and field. But God is calling your name. He's inviting you in, and he invites Zacchaeus into relationship with him. And what he says is that by inviting himself to his house, he's telling Zacchaeus he wants to be his friend. Jesus wants to be your friend. Now, he is a friend that will challenge you. He's not a friend that's comfortable with your chaos. He's really good at calming it if you let him. He invites him into his house, 
And as he's there, I love this, this interaction. Immediately, you know, Zacchaeus kind of word vomits on Jesus. Half of my possessions I give to the poor. It's just how we are. We, we get this desire, this, this pent-up energy of like, God, Jesus, I'm going to make everything right. You see, what Zacchaeus does is, is really interesting in this, in this phrase. He says, half of everything I own, I'm going to give to the poor. And anyone I've wronged, I'll pay back fourfold. Upon entering the house, you see, in the Jewish law, if I stole from you, I would owe you what I stole plus 20%. And Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give them half. This is above and beyond. And you say, well, I know the religious spirit says, well, if he was really Christian, he would have given everything he had. Listen, they believe that Zacchaeus literally was pledging everything he owned, and the other half was either debt or family inheritance that he could not give up. This is a tax man. He knows exactly what he has. He says, half of what I can give, everything I own, not just his salary, that's the key concept, his possessions. So here's the picture. He goes up to Joe Schmo and says, hey, I'm going to seize your Hyundai. And he steals your car that you get to work with. Zacchaeus then comes back. He says, hey, I know I stole that Hyundai from you. I extorted it from you. Here's my BMW. That's the picture. He goes above and beyond to make things right. This is the beauty of the gospel. It goes above and beyond restoring relationships. It goes above and beyond. It, it re- reconciles. See, Jesus has given us, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, the ministry of reconciliation. That looks like going above and beyond and going humble. See, the whole context of this, of this story, it's really unfortunate that we have chapters and verses in the Bible. I'm going to be honest with you. That was not how the Gospels were written. That was added in about the 1500s. See, when you would read this, you would have read the story of the rich young ruler right before this. And as you read the rich young ruler, there's this phrase where the disciple says, who then can be saved? Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. If the rich can't be saved, those that God would say are blessed, the culture would say are blessed, who can be saved? With God, all things are possible. The next story, Jesus goes to the richest man in the land and redeems him. That's the context of this. We have this rich, young, pious ruler that says, I've done all the law. He says, leave everything. No. And walks away, disheartened. And yet Zacchaeus is willing to give everything. He says, That's a true son of Abraham. That's the context here. See, for us to actually experience the genuine transformation that God has, we have to move that mask of materialism. Our life cannot be oriented around our acquisitions. And you say, well, man, Pastor Brandon, keep preaching to that person next to me. My spouse needs to hear that. Susie needs to hear that, Francis is saying. This is a stat. It says, the world's 20% richest, 20% of the richest in the world consume 80% of the world's resources. Global Resource List came out with this. You see, how dare that 20%? How could they do that? They should be ashamed of themselves. They then defined what that 20% was. If you or your household makes an average of more than $4 an hour, you are that 20%. We are that 20%. Consumerism is so pervasive in our life that we can't even see it. And God says there's provision all around you. What you're looking for won't satisfy in culture. It's found in Christ. And Zacchaeus gets it. And he offers everything. And here's a crazy thing that Luke does. That, that as I saw this, I'm like, why does he say this? He says, I will repay fourfold. Now, that was a really strange Jewish law. See, that law was if I slaughtered your animal, in particular, if I stole your lamb and killed it, if I shed the blood of your lamb, I had to pay you back fourfold. So he brings up this obscure Jewish law. 
here's the beautiful thing. Here's the other thing. If I slaughtered that lamb and I could not repay it, I had to offer myself into slavery to that person. As he's saying this, Jesus' next response is, today salvation has entered this house. Jesus is saying to all of us, I'll take the place of the debt you owe. No one had the right to ever say this than God. No Messiah could say, I am salvation and I have entered your house. Only God alone. Jesus became the substitute for the death and the blood of the lamb on our hands. He restores us. He makes us one. And in that final verse, he says, I have come. This is a true son of Abraham. He restores his identity. And as Zacchaeus left that day, broke without anything to offer. To top it off, he says, I'm going to give it to the poor. They're considered the outcasts of society. They're poor, they believed at that time, because God didn't love them. They're paying the penalty of a past generation's sin. If you wanted to be truly rich and respected, you'd give it to the temple. He says, I'm going to give it to the poor. And that day, Zacchaeus leaves broke in the natural, but alive and rich in spirit. We have to learn that there is a joy that can only be found in Jesus. The possessions and products can't manifest that materialism can't manufacture. And he ends with this in, in verse 10. He says, behold, I've come to seek and to save the lost. He quotes Ezekiel 34, which is the parable of the wicked shepherds and how God will come as the shepherd himself to restore his people. Jesus is looking for you. And you say, well, I've been found. He's now sent you to find others. Who's that 99 that left, that one that left the 99? He now sends us as shepherds, and he's looking for them to restore their worth and their dignity. Are we willing to take up our cross and follow him? This morning as we close here, my friend Alex has experienced an incredible transformation, and I have just love the journey of what he's done. He has a grace to witness and to reach people, and he's going to share a few stories here uh, as we close this morning. Would you welcome Alex Martinez as he preaches? Well, that was pretty convicting. Um, so I have a couple sh uh, stories to share with you guys, and um, I'm going to start off with a testimony of how we can impact those that are so integrated into the material, uh, just possessions of life, and how we, we take the world's mask and we start to refine it ourselves and to put it on and wear it to receive the approval of man. So I'm going to talk about my own journey as well on how the Lord set me free from the addiction of affirmation of man after, uh, after coming into Christ. But I'm going to start off with, um, I have a real stirring in my heart during worship, and I was crying because I'm not supposed to be right here. Like, I'm not. Statistically, I'm not. And so I, during worship, sorry, I'm changing gears. During worship, I just felt Holy Spirit come and give me a hug and hold me because I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not supposed to tell you about the glory of God and his freedom and his love. I'm not supposed to, but I am because of the mercy and grace that God had on my life. But I'm going to get into that later. <laughs> okay. So, um, last time I was up here sharing my testimony, I had dreadlocks. Some of you guys remember. Some of you liked it. Others didn't. But it's all good. <laughs> but it's all good. Um, so, 
I actually felt from the Lord to grow dreadlocks. Now, the Lord can use anything, guys. If you have a talent, if you are good at video games, cards, whatever you have, the Lord will use that to evangelize the people in the world because we need to be relational. We can't be so spiritual and unrelational that we can't communicate or share what we have with others in front of us. So I learned how to do dread maintenance. So every time I see someone with dreadlocks, I'm like, oh, bro, this is so cool. I used to have them, show them pictures, say, hey, I can, you know, do your dreads for free if you'd want. It's all strategic because I need them to sit down for two hours with me and Holy Spirit in a room. <laughs> and we'll watch what happens. So this is basically what happened. I was at Mongolian Barbecue, and my brother Emmanuel looked over, and he's like, oh, man, that dude's dreads are sweet. And I look over, and I see, I see this guy, big guy, buff short dreads, they're braided, they look pretty cool, tattoos all over his face, all over his arms, you know, and um, I'm like, oh, this is the Lord, this is going to be sweet, and so I'm slowly making my bowl, you know what I mean, I'm slow, just waiting, waiting for him to close in, and so I say something, he's like, thanks, man, and I was like, yeah, I used to have dreads, so that started the conversation, um, and I was like, who's, who's doing them? Like, are you, are you using wax, this and that, I'm speaking code, don't worry about it, you don't have to follow me. Um, and he's like, no, I want to do it this way. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. And he's like, really? Why'd you cut your dreads? And I was like, um, well, I met this girl. <laughs> and I was debating, should I cut my dreads or not, Lord? And then someone had a dream, it confirmed, so I cut my dreads. The Lord was strategic because this was before I met her father. And... <laughs> The Lord is the best wingman you can ever have in your life. I'm just saying, don't try to seek and find. The Bible says don't find. You just stay stay on the path. He will hook you up. I'm telling you. And she's now my fiance. So, (laughs) yeah. Um, So, you know, I tell him a little bit of that, but I felt my spirit. I'm going to see him again, so I'm going to withhold. So he went to go hang out uh, with his girlfriend, I'm assuming, and um, I went, you know, with my family. A week later, uh, we're in contact, and I go to his house. I think it's his house. I find out he's a rapper, and he has a large fan base, right? And uh, so I'm like, oh, this is, this is perfect. This is so good. And uh, we go into his house. Turns out it's not his house. It's actually his sugar mama's house. If you don't know what a sugar mama is, it's an older lady that takes care of younger guys and pays for everything. That's where he's living. So he has his own studio, everything. There's weed, there's just blunts, there's, there, there's just everything in this room. And I'm excited because I get to walk into his territory. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like, like Jesus was never influenced by the surroundings that he was in. The reason why he left because he said that there was unbelief there. I truly believe because no one was going to let him pray for. You know, like no one was going to allow him to pray for. For them, because they knew him. They're like, no, we're good. So I walk into this place, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be so good. He's showing me some music. We're talking. Now, this guy has fully committed to being a rapper and to looking like one, to where he has tattoos on his face. He is editing and adding on to the mask that he's creating for the world so that they look at him a certain way, and that's where he's getting his identity from, right? Two hours with this guy, and he confesses, I didn't even do it. This is Holy Spirit. He confesses, and he says, all I'm doing is marketing an image because I don't really think that this is who, and he stops. And I said, I'm, you know, doing his hair. I'm like, I'm like no, 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 bro, keep going. That's, a fi- that's, that's good. That's a good thought. Keep going. He was going to say, I don't really think this is who I am. But he stopped himself because he's committed. They're right all over his face. He's committed. But just two hours with Holy Spirit, he almost removed the mask. Right? Felt the Lord, you know, do his hair for free. I got to pray for him outside. Um, He was happy with the hair. And I, I was like, bro, let me pray for you. He comes from a background of uh, uh, Wiccans, uh, Freemason stuff, all that stuff. Um, And he was just like, okay, prayed for him. And he kind of took a step back and he just started laughing. And he's like, thanks, man, I appreciate that. And he walks in. Well, he then texts me later and he says, pray for me, you know. 
So his mask almost came off, and I know where he's at because that's where I was before I met Christ. When Christ met me, I had refined this image that I wore in the world. I was known for two things, smoking a lot of weed and partying, and don't fight him. So violence was my, like I used, these were my fighting hands. Now I put them on the sick and Holy Spirit heals them. There's always a redeeming factor to everything. Now I can walk into a party and I'm mission, I'm mission based. I don't need to drink with you so that we can connect. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to love you. I'm not going to compromise in front of you because the world doesn't need Christians that are compromising. The world needs Christians who don't look like them. That's why we're here. Sorry, I'm... You know what I mean? Holy Spirit's going. Holy Spirit's going. Holy Spirit's going. So anyways, going to my story, my masks, I, I put them on. I put them on, and, 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 and I stitched them on. I, that was me when I was in front of you. When I wasn't, I took them off. And that's all, that, you know, that's, that's been all of us at one point. And so this man, this man of God at a park one day came up to me because he was able to see past the mask. He was able to see my value through that thing that I, you know, I was wearing like a tank top, smoking weed, hanging out by myself, nice car. But he still came and he said, hey, do you know about God? I believe he's real. And he sat with me for an hour and a half. At the end of that, I met Jesus. The physical presence of God came over me. And now I was convicted Am I going to leave everything to follow Christ, all my materialism, everything to follow Christ? Or am I going to keep that and turn away from Christ? It was so real to me. This, this armor that Christ wanted to give me, this, this identity that he wanted to give me was so real to me, I couldn't deny his glory. I saw his face, and there was no mask. And I said, I want that. And he clothed me with something new, and I wear it every single day. So I come from gangs, drugs, fighting, addicted to sex, addicted to affirmation, everything, everything you could think of, that was me. But Christ came to me, and he showed me my value and who I was, and I couldn't deny to jump in all the way. Now, so I got saved, baptized, on this journey with God, Devil's trying to throw, throw things at me. And, you know, the grace of the Lord is so good. If you just keep seeking him, he will set you free. Keep seeking him, and he will set you free. I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. That it doesn't have to be a five-year-long journey. You just press in, and you yield to the potter and allow him to shape you and mold you. And you will be free. Trust me, I'm four years in the Lord, completely free. I can walk into any situation and not even be tempted by the things around me. Just because Holy Spirit is so good. And that's all I want. And that, that's all I want for you guys. And that's all I want for the people in the world. He's real. And all the other facade and everything, that's all fake. But one thing that I did struggle with, and just recently, about eight months ago, I, I, I could confidently say that I've been set free from, was the affirmation of man over the voice of God. And Brandon talked about getting real before the Lord. Him saying, God, I, I feel like I'm going to quit. And then God shouts, <laughs> from a megaphone. <laughs> Mine was, I respected this man of God, 65-year-old man in the Lord, and I really wanted to tell him all the good stuff God was doing, going to do through me that were from prophecies and from other people. And really what I was trying to do is seek his affirmation for him to say, good job, Alex. Good job. Keep going. Compliments can either destroy you or they can build you if it's unhealthy or healthy. I was looking for the unhealthy compliment. But thank God <laughs> that he has a relationship with the Lord and he's able to see past that. And he shot right at my heart and he said, you're addicted to the affirmation of man because the voice of the Lord is not good enough for you. And it hit me. But it was true. I couldn't, I couldn't respond. I was just, like, stuck. I was like, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if you ever got a word like that. Like, that's pretty, it's, it, it's good. It's, it's healthy. It's healthy. Christ loves us very maturely. 
You know, it's not, it's not an immature love. And so in order to get free from this thing, I had to stand before the Lord by myself when no one was looking on a walk and say, God, I would benefit more if Brandon or somebody would come up to me and affirm my identity in you than you doing it to me. And that's not okay. And unfortunately, I think that's a lot of us with the, within the church is we would rather someone look at us and say, you're doing good, you're doing amazing, God loves you. And we would just <gasps> feed off of it. But it's actually worse because that's going to cause you to be an altar junkie or that's going to cause you, which is true, I need to feel God in order to be loved. And that's not true. You're loved, period. And that's something that I had to learn. That I'm loved, period, whether if I feel God or not. You know, this morning I was praying and I was like, God, what do you want to do for the day? And, and I'm listening for his voice. And, you know, we always expect like, you're called to the nation. You know, we always expect that. But it was just, a, I love you. And that's it. I love you. And I'm looking for something else. But he's <laughs> just, I love you. You know. And so I had to be vulnerable, transparent, and honest before the Lord by myself. And, 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 and that could look different for some of us, but I feel like God is pulling on some strings right now and a lot of people in the room. And that could even be as deep as, God, to be honest, I don't really believe in you. I don't really believe that you're real. It could be, God, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking you for what I can get. And there's mercy, and there's love, and there's grace. But if I can encourage you, it's that we need to remove the mask of religion from our face. And the Lord's not impressed with your prayers when he can see that you're just doing it for the sake of religion. He sees it all. He sees it all. And it's an honor for me to be able to share this with you. Because Christ is love. And he will hold you and he will set you free. And he is worth the wait, and he is worth running afterwards. You run as fast as grace is, you, as grace is allowing you to run. You run as fast as that is going, and you don't stop. Can I have you guys stand? So everyone, just bow your heads, close your eyes, get intimate with the Lord. It's just you and the Lord right now. Don't worry about the person next to you. It's just you and the Lord right now. I talked about me being addicted to affirmation. Even as I stand before you right now in front of all, these, all of you guys, I have to be responsible that I'm not doing this for you just hearing me, that I'm not doing this for you to see me. I have to be a good steward of, of my heart. And us as the body of Christ, we have to be good stewards of our heart. And so right now, I just, I just get a picture of a child walking up to their father or their mother, their parent, with a bag over their head or a mask on their face. And that's a picture of us walking to our father with a bag over our head, trying to do house life, trying to do our normal child things. But clearly there's something that needs to be removed. And so if you're, if you're feeling... If you're feeling that thing, whatever it may be, you know, just get real. Like I said, there's mercy, there's love, there's grace. He already sees it, and he's going to rip it from you as soon as you confess. He is faithful and just to forgive you. So I got a few words right now. So just be with the Lord, and if this resonates with you. Someone in the room is harboring frustration and anger towards the church for not being seen, for not being appreciated and patted on the back. And the Lord says that he sees you. And you don't need anybody else from the church to say you're doing good. You need the Father's voice. Overall, you need the Father's voice. Others in the room are feeling left out from a friend group or a community gathering. They feel abandoned. And the Lord says again, if you feel alone because you're not with people, that means you haven't been with me. 
because he's there in the secret place. And he sees you. Others are performing so that they can be seen by their peers and held at a higher esteem, whether if that's through the gift that God has given you, through your work identity of what you do, so that your friends and your families can look at you and hold you on this pedestal. Just be real right now. Search your heart. Search your heart with the Lord. And the Lord says that your identity is not in your job and in your money or what you do or if you work at a coffee shop or if you're a police officer or your identity will always be found in him. So Holy Spirit, I thank you for every eye that is set on you. Father, that you would come right now in your gentleness and your grace and you would start to break the chains, break the false lies. Father, that people would be set free right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for your identity. We thank you that we don't need the affirmation of man to come and satisfy this, this, this gaping hole that we have. It doesn't matter if our earthly fathers or mothers didn't hug us or if they didn't tell us that they loved us. We know that there's a father in heaven who loves us. And that's why you say, call, call no man on earth your father. is because we have a father who's in heaven who always loves us, who will always affirm us, who will always grow us and who will always be with us through anything thank you for that love father thank you for that love come holy spirit right now thank you for loving us so well we give you all these things we we're removing the masks right now in jesus name let's just invite the prayer team up right now father we just respond to what you're speaking to us God, we do work with you on the inside. And God, we just surrender and offer the altar of our heart. So send your fire on it, God. Lord, as we sacrifice those masks, as we identify possessions that we've made our identity, as Alex called out those words with anger and frustration and need for affirmation and approval, God, we thank you that that's found in you alone so god we respond we respond to what you have just eyes closed you know what some of the things that were said today identified with me and my journey just lift your hand up father i pray for my sisters and brothers right now encounter them and meet them hope would come right now light would shine in darkness those that feel abandoned and left alone alone they're found in you god do a significant work in jesus name